methods are made. Um, but you don't have to install them. So they run quick. You've got a whole suite of tools. Um, they, uh, yeah, they'll run in the native environment. Um, uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> this is funny. I, uh, for about two months, my, my host uh, operating system was screwed up, so I, I was booting off of uh, Backtrack 3 live. And they didn't have OpenOffice, and I needed it for class. So I actually ran op portable OpenOffice through Wine in Backtrack to get OpenOffice to work easily. And later I found out you can actually add uh, a Slack's um, file to get that done. But at the time, that was a, an interesting way to get through it. So Wine is a Windows emulator for anybody who doesn't know that. And so this portable application was running through there. I ran VLC through it. It worked pretty well. So, you know, some of these applications that I'm talking about on this side, you can actually run in Linux through Wine. Um, but a lot of them are targeting Windows systems, so they're not going to really be too proficient. Uh, the what? Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. I knew I'd misspeak somehow. Wine is not an emulator, but it will allow you to run Windows files. Are we oh, everybody's kosher with that. Okay. <laughs> so what happens when you speak at DEF CON? You just get called out like that. Um, and the other option is uh, Ultimate Boot CD for Windows. Uh, if anybody has ever messed with that, it's pretty cool. It's not included by default because of Microsoft licensing stuff. Ooh, come on! I didn't get a boo for mentioning Microsoft licensing stuff. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's a portable version of Windows XP-ish. Uh, it's called uh, Windows PE. You know when you install Windows and you have that nice little boot menu and all this stuff's going on, it actually loads this small condensed version of Windows into memory and that's what controls everything. This extracts it. So it won't run everything beautifully but it'll run some of the stuff so you can kind of carry around a portable version of Windows with you which can be very helpful in certain situations. And configuration and updating. It's very simple to do. Um, I'll show you in a second uh, the structure of everything, but uh, you want to update it, you can update it. It's a USB, so you just have to install it in a certain directory. Bam, it's an updated. You don't have to worry about, you know, waiting a year for the new ISO to come out. Uh, you can update it instantly or add your own files, whatever. So these are kind of the areas I focused on. Um, it's the basic stuff that I feel like anybody would look into security and want and uh, sysadmins, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of tools. Um, I, I, there's things like, uh, well, I guess I'll go to the next slide. These are just a few of the tools that I've got running on there. Um, things like, you know, Siglin <coughs> has a ton of stuff, especially for us Linux people. Um, it's nice to have a portable version of Siglin around because you're like, ah, oh, I have all these cool strips, scripts for, for Linux and then I got to work with these, you know, Windows boxes. What do I do? Siglin on a stick. Very handy. Um, all kinds of other stuff. A lot of these, about half of these are actually new to this edition. So if you're thinking about, oh, okay, well, Backtrack screwed up. I don't want to go and get that. Uh, this one, a lot of the new stuff is like um, Nmap and Kane and Metasploit. Uh, and I haven't fully tested Metasploit, but it, it works and it runs and I haven't seen anybody else, else who actually got it running in Windows on a USB drive. I feel like if I say that in this crowd, somebody would say, I know, but as far as I know, this, this is the uh, only place that um, Metasploit's running in Windows off the flash drive. Um, there's a, all kinds of other tools you might recognize on there. It's pretty convenient. And adding your own applications. In Windows, there is uh, a lot of uh, portable app websites out there. And that's the, those are the ones I've gone through. Um, basically, they just don't have to make registry edits or install things in the system folders or whatever. So uh, some of the smaller tools in the utilities I've actually found that are very common um, that are just, you know, singular binaries like PuTTY. PuTTY is a perfect example. You know, when you install PuTTY, you don't even like, you don't get the nice little icons. It doesn't install. It just says extract me somewhere because I'll run anywhere. So that's a good example of a portable application and something like that is included on here. Uh, but there's a lot more. Linux, um, you can make static binaries uh, if you want to try that. Um, will that work 100% of the time? Probably not. Uh, have I tested it a lot? Absolutely not. Um, but it is possible. Yes. For the Windows side or the, back to the Linux side? Uh, I believe so. I, I mean, it loads everything in. But uh, that's another thing that's the 64 bit. Sorry, he asked if there's. Um, way to differentiate between 32-bit and 64-bit in Linux. Um, and that's actually an issue with a lot of these things that people, I've, been, I've tested this on a 32-bit machine. 
Um, some of these tools have 64 bit uh, counterparts that will do the same thing. Uh, I developed this for 32 bit. A lot of times if you see a tool and it's not running you can try to look it up. Uh, that's one other thing I didn't put in the slides. I have a crap ton of documentation. Uh, that's one thing that I found that was difficult when learning uh, new distributions was like, okay, sweet, I have these tools. What does that do? Uh, the only description I have is a name or something I've read. So the documentation for Katana actually has a brief summary of every single portable application out there, hence time consumption. Um, and then a brief uh, description of the distributions but not all their tools because I'm not, that, not crazy. Uh, so a lot of them will give you the websites. So if it doesn't work 32 bit you can go and get the 64 bit version. Uh, and as far as the Linux goes I, I, I know that you can do this. I haven't tested it. I know that like, the UNET booting uh, for, win for Linux is a static binary. Uh, you can get the source but it will just run. So you have to I'd tinker around with it. I don't know from distro to distro but it is possible. So you could carry things, trusted applications around with you on your thumb drive without um, having to uh, uh, you know, trust the host operating system. OS X, I don't know, whoever you'll get a Mac. I'm, I have no experience with Macs whatsoever. Um, if people know how to add portable applications to Macs, that would be awesome. I'd totally be into that uh, for, for you Mac people out there. But um, that's just not anything I've explored so far. So uh, Wakasashi. Uh, so Katana is a sword, Wakasashi is a smaller sword. Theme. Um, Forge is a forge, so yeah, I've stuck with a little bit of a theme here. Uh, USB write blocker. This is um, pretty handy. So I've tested it a little bit. So the reason I included this, uh, or I've been working on this, is uh, malware. I don't know if you guys know this, but malware is now targeting USB drives. You, you, you might have been aware of this, you might have seen this in your environment, and you might have come to DEF CON talks and heard about this. It's live, it's, in, it's native, and it's a beautiful way to transmit malware because everybody's, you know, so concerned about it. Uh, is, you know, my Firefox is up to date. Do I have, you know, no script? Do I have all these security features in place? And then USB drive, they just hop right on there and then, you know, you never know the wiser. So um, while a lot of these things on there will be definitely flagged by antivirus, uh, this Metasploit is on the stick. The antivirus just explodes when you stick this in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and almost, uh, almost everything, at least half the things on there, it just hacker tool, hacker tool, like the, I couldn't even scroll down fast enough. It just kept shooting up. Um, so that's another warning. Uh, if you're going to mess with this, your antivirus is going to just throw a hissy fit. It's going to go crazy. So you might want to disable it before mounting this. Or don't, sometimes it doesn't auto run. You know, if it won't auto run and scan the device, sometimes you're okay. But the first time you click on something, it, you know, tries to get at it. So two reasons that I have the write blocker. One is for malware so it doesn't get on the drive and you're not transmitting that everywhere. And the other one is to prevent those pesky antiviruses from deleting all of the awesome stuff that's on here. Um, I tested it. It worked. I'm sure because I announced this at DEF CON. Next week they're going to be able to figure out how to delete my tools from Katana. But for now, <laughs> as of like today, this works preventing anything from accessing it problem side, a lot of these tools do want to write stuff to their directory. So some of them might not work in this way and you can't store your information there. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, there's another thing. Uh, the Wakasashi is very tiny. Um, sorry, I was going to just. I recommend not putting it on a flash drive because that's kind of not the point. If you put it on a flash drive to run and prevent the other one, well, congratulations, the one you just put in got infected. So uh, that doesn't help anything. I recommend, you know, like the, the business card size, and this isn't quite right, but the, the really small CDs, some you can keep in your back pocket, business card ones, it's, it's like a couple K, if that. So you can easily keep it on something else, um, a medium that's not going to be infected by malware. Uh, it's very simple to use and I think right now, yeah, I'll try to bring up my live demo. Let me check something else real quick. Um, yeah, I did get that in a minute but uh, it's, uh, I have an 8 gig um, mostly because I like the idea of uh, being able to add a lot. Actually I developed on a, on a 16 gig. Uh, it takes 4, you can put it on a 4 gig. Um, it's not going to throw a hissy fit and yeah. So I'd say, I suggest 16. They're dirt cheap now. Um, and of course, 
More epic fail, it won't move to the other window. Alright, so I now officially hate Compass Barrel. Or Compass Fusion. I used to love it because it makes you do, you can do cool little things like twirling desktops and wobbly windows and it's great. And now that it has destroyed my presentation at DEF CON, I'm officially uh, against it. I probably, if there's anybody on the Compass Fusion team here, this is a problem. It's a serious problem. <laughs> you guys need to fix that stuff, alright? I'll find you. <laughs> okay, well, so, um, that live demo, I can't, Windows gets stuck on this one and won't go up there. What in the world? All, right, all you Linux uh, naysayers, congratulations, you now have more fuel for the fire. Um, all right, well, it's, it's pretty simple. Sorry, it's not up there. You click, uh, you run the Wakasashi, you hit yes and it makes it uh, read only. You hit no, it makes it read writable. Um, when you want to mount something, you, it, re it edits a registry value. So you, you change it and then you mount it and then you can unchange it, doesn't matter. It's only at the point of mount that things make a difference. So don't, you know, you can unmount it and you really want to change it back because if you're on a user's computer and, you know, they're trying to plug in their iPod and it's not running and they're going to find you and, you know, that's obviously the more, most important thing on their computer is that they can sync to iTunes. So if you went in and had to, you know, remove some virus, that's really not as important to them as being able to sync to iTunes. So you really want to undo what you do uh, when you make it read only. So it sticks up there. Uh, no live demo. Great. Um, Katana is available at the Hackers for Charity booth right now. Um, the older versions are available on my website. So here's the, the four gig. Uh, the new one, I, I'm still in debate about adding some other uh, live uh, distributions, but for now it's about four gig, so you can run on a four gig drive. Um, it's a RAR file. I think I get to that in a second. Yes, it's a RAR file. I have so many people ask me, why can't I burn this to DVD? It's because it's not, it's not supposed to be burned to DVD. It's a RAR file. You extract it. Um, it is on DVD there, but in RAR format. So you extract it, you run it, it, the instructions are on there. I just thought I would put that out there because people come up to me all the time or send me emails and stuff and say I can't get this to work. You extract it into the root of the flash drive. If you extract it into a subfolder, it's not going to work either. So those are the two biggest things, problems that I get all the time. Um, yeah, I think that's most of it. That's just the instructions there. You can create an ISO. This is new for this version as well. There's a couple new things. Uh, the Forge one is new. This is new. Um, it works okay. Uh, some of the live distributions change a lot of things around between USB and CD versions. So uh, while it will make, it's really nifty if you want to hand it out to a lot of people. Uh, you can create, not, you know, you can create the portable application stuff. You can configure it any way you want, add, remove, whatever. Uh, hand it out to all the people you work with and then you have all these tools on there. So a live ISO option is really good. Some of the th applications, or some of the live ISOs will boot, or some of the, sorry, the portable um, distributions will boot. Uh, by the time this is full release, I hope to have them all working. Right now it's just some of them working. But that is the final plan is to make the ISO exactly the same as the uh, USB version. So tips and tricks. Um, since you're working in a live environment, uh, scripting is awesome. Um, uh, you know, the, the one beautiful thing about live is, and I know this is why I really enjoy it, uh, I s screw things up sometimes that might have come across already. Uh, and so it's nice to be able to boot into, you know, a live distribution, do whatever you want, absolutely, you know, anger the kernel, and, uh, and then you just reboot and everything is magically back where it was. So that's, you know, one of the great parts of ISO. But the other flip to that is modifications can be tricky unless you do persistent um, I'm not going to talk about that much here, but look into persistent mode. You can actually save things on the system. So if you do want to update Backtrack, you want to update Ubuntu, you can. If you boot into persistent mode, it will store it there. Everything should work fine. But if you, like me, enjoy the live environment and being able to mess around with things and not having fear of screwing stuff up, uh, scripting is awesome. This is just a couple of, of URLs um, for uh, portable applications that you can look into. As I said, I didn't include all of them. There's a lot of them in there. there. Actually, I did find this one website for OSX stuff, but it's like the really high end uh, um, open source applications like OpenOffice, so there wasn't really any security stuff. Uh, yeah, so 
This is my beg and plea. Uh, I only have so much time. I'm basically the only dev on this entire thing. So, and I'm a grad student, so I really just don't have tons of time.